Welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. We've got something very, very serious to discuss tonight. I'm getting word that, um, that gluten sensitivity has taken the North Pole by storm, literally by storm. And so tonight we're going to dive into some very serious things around Santa Claus and, and Frosty the Snowman and Rudolph and his fellow reindeers uh, because the overwhelming evidence of a gluten sensitivity epidemic hitting the North Pole is, is absolutely forthcoming. So we're going to dive into that tonight. Stick with me. If you've got questions, just like every other episode of Pig Dr. Osborne's Brain, make sure you get those in early. We'll do our best to answer them as we get through this very serious information tonight. So without further ado, let, let's dive in to what we've got here. Um, is Santa Claus gluten sensitive? Well, you know, there's some very obvious signs that gluten, again, is taking Santa and, and his, uh, his family at the North Pole down. And one of the biggest symptoms that we see is the rosacea uh, in the cheeks. The rosacea is very, very prominent, as you can see, and Santa's face just right here. And so rosacea, as we know, is an autoimmune inflammatory skin condition uh, in the face. And so one of the many symptoms of gluten sensitivity for Santa Claus. We also see the swelling of the hands and feet. Uh, one of the reasons for gloves um, is, is the swelling, to control the swelling. And he wears boots, but under his boots, these are compression stockings. Um, you see those on the elves a lot. They wear the compression stockings, and that's to keep the, the lymphedema, the fluid, um, from, from just totally swelling the feet and creating more pressure on the heart. As we know, Santa's already overweight and obese. And he's got, you know, a major impact on his heart for every mile of blood vessel uh, or for every, I should say, every pound of fat, Santa's heart has to grow about a mile of blood vessels to feed that pound of fat. And this is what makes it very, very difficult. It's the obesity leading to the, you know, to the stress and pressure on the heart that leads to the swelling and the congestion in the feet. Again, so that obesity. Another symptom, a lot of people don't realize this, but because of celiac disease, obesity is actually more common as a, as a symptom of gluten sensitivity than is being underweight. There's a lot of celiacs can't put weight on. Santa can't just seem to get the weight to come off. Now, a big part of that, as, as I'm sure you're aware, if he's ever come to your house, right? He's always eating cookies. I mean, that's a major, major problem. And these, these, these cookies, obviously, they're full of gluten. Um, many cookies, many brands of cookies, depending on what you leave at your house, have so much gluten in them. They're, they have extra gluten. They add vital wheat gluten to a lot of baking goods to make the dough, to make the cookie chewier, to make it softer. And of course, Santa's got a prolific kind of drive toward eating these chewier cookies because his, his teeth from all the sugar at the North Pole, his teeth have really struggled and he's, and he's wearing dentures. It's, it's a little known secret, but um, all the sugar has rotted out his teeth to a large extent and so he needs them to be chewier so he can actually eat them and that requires more gluten in the baking. So we know he's getting a lot of gluten that way. We know that gluten, again, is contributing to the obesity it's contributing to the dental and oral problems, and it's leading to some other things that are very problematic, some, some behavioral issues. And we, we see behavioral issues in people with gluten sensitivity all the time, right? I mean, we, we've now linked depression, and we've linked um, schizophrenic type disorders and behaviors. We've linked autism. We've linked obsessive compulsive behavioral disorders to to, to gluten exposure, but where Santa really fits this is in his obsessive compulsive behavior around toys. If you ever, if you ever watch Santa Claus, he's always got a bag of toys. I mean, he, he's never around without that bag of toys. I mean, he's just obsessively um, carrying that bag around that's full of toys and other goods. So we know he's obsessive compulsive around this, but he also has developed repetitive speech tics. So, you know, one of the, one of the hallmarks um, in the neurological manifestation of gluten sensitivity is speech tics. A lot of people develop these, but, you know, he's, he's constantly saying, ho, ho, ho. It's, it's so constant, right? So we know he's got a speech impediment, a speech tick, if you will. He's obsessive about toys. 
right? He's obsessive about cookies. He's always eating them. And again, all these things together are, are overwhelming evidence of a gluten sensitivity issue. Frankly, as, as old as Santa Claus is, I'm, I'm, I'm frankly surprised he hasn't passed yet from the, the side effects of gluten and the manifestation of gluten sensitivity. But one of the other things, this is super common, I didn't even put this on here, but, it, but we'll talk about this first. So too much rum in the eggnog. Some people actually leave alcohol, and it is so you know now he's, he's got alcohol, and as, as we know, the sugar's bad enough, right? Because the sugar leads to yeast overgrowth, which is part of what causes the belly to swell, okay? And be, be so rotund. Uh, it's the fermentation of the yeast from all the sugar, but then we add the alcohol plus the eggnog, which is very high in sugar, but it's also, remember, what is eggnog? It's made, oops, it's made from dairy, right? And so we know that dairy can actually mimic gluten as well. And, you know, most of you, unfortunately, are leaving Santa A1 dairy, which is linked to autoimmune disease as well. And it's also been shown to mimic gluten. So we've got, you know, too much rum, too much alcohol. How many, how many rum eggnogs do you think on a night where Santa is delivering to uh, you know, over a billion households, how many of these do you think he's drinking, right? It's the same thing with cookies. I mean, it's, it's, it's overwhelming, really, to think about it, to think about how resilient Santa is to just still be here with us. So, again, the milk is another issue because many of you aren't leaving eggnog. You're just leaving a cup of milk with those cookies. And so, again, that, that A1 milk, and it's probably, you know, the milk itself is probably not grass-fed. And so, you know, it's, it's loaded with omega-6, which is going to be more heart inflammatory. But we also, we also know that, again, the milk proteins can mimic gluten. So it's just one more element that Santa, Santa's biology has to deal with, right? So Santa's in trouble. Um, this last, kind of this last piece of evidence, I was, I was thinking about it earlier today. How does he get down all these chimneys? Right, because he's he's got to be able to slide down the chimney, but he's so overweight. So so how does he do that? I mean, a chimney, you know, it's not very big. Your know, average household chimney, and so you know, one of the side effects of gluten exposure is excessive oil production, and and so it seems, um, it seems pretty obvious to me that the excessive oil lubrication that's occurring in Santa's skin is leading to this you know supernatural ability to slip down a chimney right, with, with a bag of toys um, saying ho, 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 right, all this obsessive compulsive behavior and then raiding your kitchen to drink your milk and eat your cookies, right, with the obesity, the rosacea. You know, Santa also wears glasses, so his vision has started to go to a certain extent. We know gluten, I did an entire show uh, a couple of weeks ago on gluten and vision, so we know that this is a major, major problem for Santa Claus and I, and I, just, I just hope he's gonna be okay. But then it, I didn't stop at Santa Claus because it was also affecting the elves. Um, so if we really look at the quantity of gluten at the North Pole, you know, elves are supposed to be taller than they are. Um, what they suffer from is, is a condition called FTT, um, which we know gluten causes. This is very common in, in non-elf children as well, right? So we, we have young children that, that are exposed to gluten and they fail to grow, they fail to thrive. So they have redu reduced weight, shortened stature. As, as we can see, this is a normal sized elf here. And then these are elves that are have their growth stunted, right? So we know elves suffer from a form of failure to thrive. Um, they also have a lot of co obsessive compulsive behavior around toys. I mean, they're making toys year round, it's all they do, right? We, but we also see the obsession and the compulsion in, in elves because of the way that they dress. They're always, if you ever notice an elf, you, you don't ever see an elf wearing any other color than green. This is part of the, the obsessive compuls, compulsion that they have. Santa Claus has the same thing, only he's always wearing red and white, but the elves prefer green. So they have this obsessive compulsive behavior around their choice of, of clothing, right? And then, you know, if you look at their diets, this is the Elf Food Guide Pyramid. Um, you know, they don't eat as many cookies as Santa Claus. I mean, they do eat cookies. Don't get me wrong. Elves like cookies. But, you know, the number one list, uh, the, the top of their Food Guide Pyramid is syrup. But, but in today's world, they're no longer getting this really good 
maple syrup. So it's, it's no longer maple syrup that they're getting, right? It's this, it's this synthetic maple flavored, right? Maple, it's very important that you understand the difference, right? Maple flavored syrup, which is technically not even syrup because it's, it's really, it's, where's it derived from? It's derived from corn, which is extremely problematic, right? And so, so the elves are constantly sipping on syrup, right? While, while simultaneously sucking on candy canes. Now the same problem here, right? If we look at this, this food guide pyramid of the elves, right? It's all really pretty much the candy on it is corn based because whether, whether or not it's corn syrup being used, these, these wrapped candies that these elves eat, a lot, again, a lot of it's corn syrup, but also if you notice the wrapping, if you ever open one of these, how does that candy not stick to the wrapper? Um, it's a trick of, of the candy industry. They take wheat dust and they dust the candy with the wheat dust to prevent it from sticking to the wrapper. And so the elves are constantly opening up their candy, right? And they're being exposed to that wheat dust, getting this mega gluten exposure. Remember, it only takes one breadcrumb size of gluten to create an inflammatory response for up to two months. So, so again, we've got shortened stature. As I mentioned earlier, they're wearing compression socks, right? And this is, again, to, to stop the lymphedema and, and the peripheral swelling from occurring. And, and so, and then the compulsion around the color green and the compulsion around candies and, and toys, constant eating of, of candy and the production of toys. So we, so we really have to understand that gluten, gluten is a major issue. Now some of you are like, Dr. Osmond, what do you mean corn? Why has that got gluten? If, if that's you, if you don't realize that there's a form of gluten in corn, please go back and, and look at some of my research. You can read my book, No Grain, No Pain. Go check it out at the library, or, or you can come to Gluten-Free Society and check that out in, in the blog. But Corn is a major, major gluten-containing grain. It contains a type of gluten called zane, which is very detrimental to people with gluten sensitivity. And, and you know, as breaking news shows, the elves uh, have a major gluten epidemic going on within their population right now. And then that, that brings us to some of the other residents of the North Pole. And, and one I'm really, really worried about is, is Rudolph. Um, you know, Rudolph's got a super important job. For those of you who maybe don't know who Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is, he's the head boss that helped Santa's sleigh fly all over the world, right? It, Rudolph, he's, he's got magic so that he can pull the sleigh. And, and if you understand it, he's also got this, this red nose, right? And so this is actually a form of, of acute severe um, uh, rhin rhinopathy or, or nose inflammation, right? So this is, this is, this is very common with gluten, it is we'll see the nose swell and inflame. And, and as a matter of fact, Rudolph got the job of being the head reindeer because of this condition. So some would argue that Rudolph really depends on his gluten sensitivity in order to keep his job. But you know, because the red nose, you know, if you're not aware of this, it's really bright and it helps Santa see at night as he's flying, you know, as he's flying his, his sleigh around the globe to deliver toys to the children. So Rudolph, again, his bright nose is a consequence of that gluten exposure just leading to a fluorescence uh, within the nose itself. And then if, you, if you've ever seen the reindeer when they fly, and, and all the reindeer have this, not just Rudolph, but, but Rudolph has it really bad. And that's, you know, have you ever watched Superman on TV? And when Superman flies, he's, he doesn't move his legs. If you've ever noticed that, he, he just kind of flies with his cape behind him and his legs are straight and his body is soaring through the air. And he's not kicking his legs as, he, as he's flying. Um, but if you ever watch any of the reindeers fly, what are they all doing? They're, they're all constantly kicking their legs. And, and part of the reason why is we know gluten can cause restless leg syndrome. It's one of the neurological consequences of gluten exposure. So, you know, we know this to be the case. Rudolph has a severe, severe case of restless legs. If you, if you ever watched 
when you were a kid, uh, there was a documentary on Rudolph as he was growing up, and, and he was constantly running around and moving, right? And this is, and the reindeer are all like this. They're, they constantly have to move around and, and, and jump around. Um, it's not really part of their training. It's because they all have restless leg syndrome. And one of the reasons why, it, ha it has to do with the magic deer corn um, that they're being fed. Remember, this, this form of corn gluten is, is a major contributing um, factor to this acute severe rhinitis and restless leg syndrome that we see Rudolph suffer with. So again, Rudolph, extremely gluten sensitive. Um, unfortunately, he, 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 he relies on that illness, right, to, to light the sky for Santa. But so, so we want to keep our, our, our thoughts and prayers with Rudolph as he, as he has to do that very, very important job, but he needs, he needs that glowing nose to do so. I'm also really concerned about Frosty. If those of you who, who know Frosty the Snowman is who I'm referring to. And, you know, one of the problems that we see with Frosty is, is he's obviously overweight. Um, and this is one of those consequences, again, as I was mentioning when I was talking about Santa and Santa's response to gluten. Well, we see the same thing with Frosty. Um, you ever wonder why Frosty always wears a scarf? So like this scarf that's around his neck, no matter when you see him, there's, there's a reason why he wears that scarf. Frosty actually has a goiter. And, and what I want you to understand, so goiter is an enlargement of the thyroid gland. So we, we've got... Frosty is, is being exposed to gluten on a regular basis too. And in part, his, one of his biggest sources of exposure is corn as well. And it's his corn cob pipe. So, you know, for those of you who don't know, Frosty, he, he smokes a corn cob pipe. And so he's getting glutened as a result of that pipe, right? And so that gluten is in a, a secondarily, it's affecting his his thyroid gland. So he has a goiter, and so he's cold all the time. And it's one of the reasons why icicles form all over his body. It has to do with he can't regulate his metabolism properly. And so we see he's, you know, he's, he's always wearing gloves. He's got cold hands. He's covered in snow constantly. Um, you know, the goiter issue, the, the obesity. He's also, if you ever take his hat off, you know, you'll find that Frosty's bald. And, and again, hair loss and, and testosterone and androgen problems are a common consequence of gluten sensitivity. So, so Frosty's really struggling. So we want to keep him in our thoughts and prayers as well as, um, you know, as, as he uses gluten so much in the work that he does. But, but again, Rudolph and Frosty and Santa and the elves, I, you know, again, how do they do it? Because, I mean, many of you are asking, well, if, 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 if these guys can eat gluten and they're, you know, arguably they're, they're over a thousand years old. I mean, how long has Santa been circling the globe delivering children's toys? It's been a pretty long time, hundreds of years. How does he do it, right? How, how do they do it? What is, this, what is this longevity that they have in the, in, the, in the obvious face of a gluten sensitivity epidemic at the North Pole? And, and I think we come to the answer and to the conclusion, um, they have Christmas magic, right? So Christmas magic is really what allows this to happen. It allows Santa to eat the cookies and it, it keeps him from having a heart attack or a stroke and it allows him to be overweight and still slip down a chimney. Uh, it allows the elves to be obsessive about the work that they do so they can deliver value to the world. But but, but you guys don't rely on Christmas magic, right? You don't, you don't want to try to rely on Christmas magic so that you can eat gluten. Like, you want to avoid it because we're not, we're probably not going to live hundreds of years delivering toys and, and, and the like to the world. Like, that's not us. So just be aware that Santa and his crew have Christmas magic protecting them from gluten. The best we have is gluten shield, but I, I still don't recommend going and, and trying to eat the quantity of gluten that Santa Claus eats or that any of the North Pole residents eat in the course of their day. So uh, I wanted to break that to you because a lot of people um, are very concerned about the health of Santa. And again, this is a major epidemic at the North Pole gluten sensitivity. It's also a major epidemic here in the United States as well as many other industrialized countries around the world that depend on Santa. So again, make sure that you're not relying on Christmas magic to go eat gluten.
Because if you do, I, I fear that, that you're going to end up with a major problem over the holidays that, that Santa and the reindeer and Frosty and Rudolph don't, don't necessarily have to worry about because they have that very, very powerful North Pole Christmas magic. So all that being said, let's, uh, let's dive into your questions tonight. Okay, anything goes tonight. This is, um, again, a very important topic. But uh, any question goes tonight. This is a free-for-all. I don't do many of these. So if you've got a question, hopefully I've got an answer. So let's, let's dive in. So let's see here. Um, I heard parasite detox can reverse gluten sensitivity. Is this true? Also, how and when should one use gluten shield and can we use it for life? Um, so part one to that question is, can a parasite cleanse, reverse gluten sensitivity? Then the answer to that is a big fat no. I don't know where you heard that, but that sounds awful irresponsible for somebody um, to be talking about that. Um, parasite cleanse does not heal Gluten sensitivity. And one of the things that you need to understand about gluten sensitivity, if you don't, is that gluten sensitivity is, is, is not a disease. So a parasite cleanse isn't going to cure it because gluten sensitivity is not a disease. What is gluten sensitivity? It's a state of genetics. You either have the genes or you, or you don't have the genes. You know, Santa, the reindeer, the elves all have the genetic component and many many of us have this genetic component where because we have the genes the way we turn those genes on to produce inflammation is by being exposed to the gluten so the gluten itself you, you know you don't not as in here's how we know this see, not all people with gluten sensitivity go on to develop celiac disease but everybody with celiac disease is gluten sensitive and so again it, it's a, it's a genetic piece so if you have the genes this is why I always recommend don't bother with the tests that don't pick up on your genes. Your genes are the most important thing to measure because and, and you, you can't trick them. Um, so genetics are critical to understand. And if you have the genes and you eat gluten, you're going to react to the gluten. Your body is going to perceive gluten as a threat. And no amount of parasite cleanses are going to correct that. So now it's, it's important to know that there, there's celiac disease um, has this this presentation that it comes with, and this is where whoever you were listening to, maybe they were confused. Celiac disease leads to something called villus atrophy. This is a degradation of the villi in your intestines that causes severe malnutrition, potentially weight loss, and, and, other, um, and other major problems like massive diarrhea and gastrointestinal pain. It's linked to 11 different kinds of cancer. This is celiac disease caused by gluten, right? It causes villus atrophy. But there's another, and this is also sometimes referred to as celiac sprue. Okay, now there's another type of sprue uh, called tropical sprue. And tropical sprue is caused by a parasite. And so you... You know, again, I don't, I don't know exactly what you heard, but, but if you have tropical sprue but not celiac disease, then doing a parasite cleanse would help with the villus, because tropical sprue can also cause villus atrophy. So cleansing that parasite might lead to a, a recovery of your villi, but these aren't the same thing. These are not synonymous. Tropical sprue is a parasite-driven disease. Celiac disease is a gluten-driven disease. Okay, part two to that question I think was, can you take gluten shield, or how, why do you take gluten shield, and do you, can you take it for life? I mean, you can take it as much as you want. It's a digestive enzyme formula, but the proper way to use gluten shield is to take it when you eat OPF, other people's food, or if you're traveling, or if you're eating out. Um, if you're preparing all of your own food, and you, um, you don't necessarily have a problem um, with preparing your own food proper, right, grain-free, then you shouldn't need to take gluten shield unless you just have damage to your pancreas or damage to your GI tract from years of gluten exposure, in which case gluten shield works as a very, very good digestive enzyme. 
but um, generally it's designed to help protect you from accidental gluten exposure or gluten cross-contamination. You can take it as long as you want, as much as you, uh, not as much like they'll take the whole bottle, but take two capsules as a general rule of thumb before you're eating, uh, if you're traveling and eating or if you're eating other people's food. Um, Lynn's asking, when will your food sensitivity test be ready for us? We're working out the final details, Lynn. Stay patient. Probably, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping and anticipating the, the, hopefully the late January of 2022. So just next month, it's not very far away. Um, what do I think about DMSO use for pain? Is it safe? Also, how long do I need to take Ultra Dim before I feel relieved for nice with it? So DMSO, I don't know that I really would recommend DMSO for pain. I, I don't think that's the best choice. If you're struggling with pain and you don't know why, DMSO is not really going to solve the why. It, 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 um, when, and it wouldn't be a great choice, in my opinion. If you want something natural that you can use, I, I, I recommend our, our um, White Willow Complex along with higher doses of omega-3 fatty acids, um, you know, anywhere from four to five grams. Um, also, I would recommend something more along the lines of turmeric, vitamin C, and quercetin, uh, because those all have very supportive inflammatory uh, modulating properties. Um, as far as ultra dim, if, if it depends on why your night sweats are there. If you're using dim, a dim product for night sweats, um, you know, for some, it takes several weeks for it to really kick in. Um, but it could be that your night sweats are being caused by something entirely different. And so that, that would be, I would, I would give it three to four weeks. And if it's not doing much, I, I, I would question whether or not that's even part of what's why you're having night sweats. Let's see here. How much zinc do you suggest on a daily dose? Depending on... Um, on your age and your weight, you know, anywhere from 10 to 25 milligrams um, is relatively safe. But if you're going to take it indefinitely long term, it's definitely a good idea to get your level checked periodically along with your copper level because too much zinc over too much time can disrupt copper and lead to copper uh, deficit. Um, also, would be complex cause me to burp and have re. Uh, Generally not. B complex is generally not. I mean, what we see cause people burping in the supplement industry typically is fish oil, omega three, uh, but B complex not typically. Now you might have a very unique and different experience, but um, but not typically something that causes burping. What could be the reason for a low white blood count? That's a great question. Um, so low white counts. Remember, white blood cells come from bone marrow. And so you, you have, if we draw a bone here, and so the marrow inside of your long bones contain stem cells, and these stem cells generate white blood cells. So there are certain nutrients that are necessary for the marrow to be able to do this. One of them is B12, folate is also important for this process. Zinc is important, magnesium is important for this. So any of these nutrient deficiencies can be related to low white counts. It's not uncommon to see that at all. Now the other things that can cause that, there are certain kinds of cancers and tumors and other things that can cause chronic low white counts. But these are nutrients that can definitely contribute to low white counts. And this, you know, these are not, this is not a comprehensive list. There's another thing that I see frequently lead to, to low white blood cells, and that is mold exposure. Mold is immunosuppressive, so it actually will affect over time your white blood cells. Another is chronic infection. So if you have a chronic infection, this, we see this sometimes in people with Lyme disease. Uh, which is a chronic infection, it, where it, it just causes more utilization by the body of white blood cells in an attempt or in an effort to fight the illness. And so chronic infection, it doesn't have to just be Lyme. There are a lot of examples here, but they can cause low white counts. So you've got different things commonly that can cause low white counts. My advice, if you've got them, get it checked out and um, you know, make sure that you figure it out. I get with your doc and make sure together you guys can figure it out. Um, 
Let's see here. I like some of the commentary here. No cookies for my Santa, just great gluten-free stuff. That's good for a squirrel because Santa doesn't need more gluten as we, as we laid out earlier here. I uh, have serotonin syndrome. I reduced uh, tyramine and fat intake. I'm taking B2 and fever few herbal for migraine on a grain-free diet, past intracellular test. What else can I do? Or take if you've got serotonin syndrome, you you really you should get with your doctor to have your you know confirmation that that's actually what's causing it. I've seen a lot of people think they do, but you really you want to have your neurotransmitter levels measured. So this can be measured. So talk with your doctor about measuring directly measuring your serotonin. The other thing you might consider. Uh, is doing some genetic testing around the processing of, of serotonin. So, I mean, we, we to make serotonin, we take tryptophan, which is an amino acid, and through several chemical conversions, we get to serotonin. And this process requires copper, and it requires vitamin C, and to get serotonin, to, to convert serotonin into its intermediate metabolites, melatonin is one of them, you, you need magnesium um, in a very big way. And so some people that are low in magnesium have a hard time with getting rid of or processing serotonin out. So that, I mean, there are a lot of different reasons biochemically why that can happen. The best thing to do is, is to get those pathways measured so that you can get definitive around it. Uh, let's see here. What causes broken capillaries on my face? That's that's rosacea, right? So um, those broken capillaries, they're, they're nutritionally, there are a number of things that can do it. Vitamin C, vitamin K deficiency, copper and iron deficiency can contribute to that as well. Um, I am severely sensitive to corn, even toothpaste causes me to be congested. Can a person overcome this sensitivity? Um, Probably not if you're gluten sensitive. Remember what I said earlier is that gluten sensitivity includes corn. It's just that the rest of the world is ignorant um, because of food labeling laws. That so we get, you know, we get corn is on the okay list, right? If we look at at the classic grains for for celiac disease as an example, they, you know, barley, rye, oats and wheat, the brow grains are classically considered to contain gluten, and they're the ones that are it, on the package, if they're not in a food, they can label that food gluten free. But corn generally flies under that radar. So, if you're, yeah, I, what I would suggest, if you want to know whether or not you're gluten sensitive and you ha and you don't know, is get gluten sensitivity genetic testing done. If it's positive, you're not corn sensitivity is never going away. Um, so, so hopefully that's helpful for you. Yesterday I made a gluten-free pumpkin pie sweetened with maple sugar. I have already eaten half of it. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, Mark, that um, that you made that with real maple syrup and not with you know what the elves use in their food guide pyramid that that fake that fake synthetic maple stuff, right? Um, my gums are very inflamed and itchy. It's very uncomfortable to brush my teeth and even eat. Any suggestions? Yeah, Linda, that's a great question. So I've seen, look, I've seen some really, really unique things cause gum inflammation, but one of the biggest is food. Um, if you're eating food that you're sensitive or reactive to, it will, it will make your gum healing very, very difficult. And so you can have, you know, repetitive gum bleeding. Uh, so food sensitivity testing is, is really a good idea in that situation. Uh, one time, I, I, not one time, so there's actually several times I've seen this be the case. The reason I mention it is because so many people with excessive gum bleeding, they go to their dentist and what do they get prescribed? They get a high fluoride toothpaste or mouthwash, right? They say, take more fluoride because that'll stop your gums from bleeding. But one of the things that I've seen cause excessive gum bleeding is fluoride. And so I've actually seen cases where people, in order to get their gums to quit bleeding, they had to cut out fluoride, not just from a toothpaste or a mouthwash, but even like fluoridated drinking water where they had to filter their water with like a you know, reverse osmosis filter. 
So those are all possibilities. And there are a number of nutritional deficiencies can cause excessive bleeding. Number one nutrition deficiency that causes gum bleeding is vitamin C deficiency. You need, your gums are collagen. And collagen, you know, is like a rope. It's a trihelix. Um, and so if you can imagine microscopically, it's if you've ever seen a big rope on a boat, it's like three little ropes wrapped around to make one big rope. That's what collagen looks like microscopically. And between each of these fibers, these rope fibers, you have like these little rungs, like ladder rungs. Those are called collagen crosslinks. And in order to form these, and why these are important is this is what makes collagen strong and elastic and keeps it from breaking too easily. These crosslinks, you need vitamin C and you need copper to form them. And so a lot of people with easy bruising and bleeding gums, they have this vitamin C and copper deficit that, they're, that they need to get corrected in order to, to get good collagen cross-link formation. Okay, let's see here. Um, or making, let's see, no, 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 not a question. What's the difference between multinutrients and ultranutrients? Predominantly the B vitamins. So if you're looking at, at using one of my multis, the, the multinutrients is a higher dose of B vitamins across the board, um, whereas ultranutrients is a lower dose. Those are the primary differences to help you make a decision. Does anyone know if Santa and the elves and reindeer have been jabbed? Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, hell. Um, I don't know. I, I think Christmas magic protects Santa from COVID just the same way it protects him from, um, you know, from gluten sensitivity. If Santa has been, oh, wait, oh gosh, there's a whole conversation going on in here. <laughs> oh, do you know anything about uh, cancer caused by certain recent procedures being pushed on everybody. Yeah, I know this. I mean, a lot of my colleagues are, are seeing massive increases in the recurrence of cancer in people who were in remission after having recent treatments uh, for the disease that shall not be named. Um, Dennis asking, my, he says, my chiropractor said that waking up from sleep is stressful to the body. Do I agree with that? I, I do, I, but not 100%. Let me explain what I mean. If you wake up from sleep naturally, so what's the, what's the right way? And you're lying in bed, and uh, I'm a terrible artist, so forgive my bad art. Um, you're in bed, right? And so, you know, let's say right back here, there's a window, and the light is coming in and you know the sun's coming in and it hits your eyes naturally and you wake up because that sunlight woke you up this is not stressful so this is the stressless way to wake up very little stress however if you're one of those that your shades are drawn and there is no sunlight and you're getting up at four in the morning and you're setting an alarm clock or you got a little baby in your bed next to you and they wake up screaming or crying or whatnot. Um, this is very, very stressful to the body. It's a shock to the body. So in that, in that way, I agree just with that caveat. So one of the things that if you're an early riser like me, I, I usually get up, you know, somewhere around 435 um, is I use what's, what's called a light alarm clock. And, and so instead of a noise, it, it, it's a dimmer. It's a, it starts out as this little dim light and it gets brighter and brighter and brighter over a period of about 20 minutes. It, so it emulates or it synthesizes more naturally what a, sun, a sunrise might do. So your eyes are adjusting as the light is coming on and that's a much stre less stressful way to wake up. So check that out if, you, if you're trying to mitigate your stress. Can gluten sensitivity be related to the onset of AFib? Yes, absolutely it can, as, and as well as sleep apnea, Sue. So answer is yes to both of those questions. Um, they can also be independent of each other, but I have seen numerous people with gluten sensitivity have both of those conditions and even some having it together simultaneously. What do I think about sodium thiosulfate for cleansing the gut? I don't. I don't think it's a great um, 
a, a great cleanser. I think the best gut cleanser in the world is just my humble opinion, take it for what you will, but is vitamin C. Um, vitamin C has so many functions and it can naturally cleanse your gut um, without any concern for, for harmful side effects or, or, uh, uh, or, or toxicity. Can celiac cause meningitis in children? No, it, it, celiac is not going to cause meningitis because the cause of meningitis, generally speaking, there's different kinds, but there's viral meningitis, there's bacterial meningitis. What celiac can do, though, is, is distract your immune system and predispose you to infection. So although celiac is not the cause, it can be a predisposing factor for an increased risk for the development of those infectious diseases. Um, let's see. Um, Allie's asking, can we avoid copper insufficiency? Yeah, you, you can. Um, you can. If you're multivitamin daily, has copper in it, it's a good way to get it outside of diet, beyond diet, but copper insufficiency is, is very easy to, to avoid if you eat foods that are rich in copper and, and, uh, and you have good digestion, good absorption. If you've had, and then this part two of that question is, I've had gallbladder, my gallbladder removed and I struggle with nutrient absorption, should I take gluten shield? I'm deficient in ADEK, zinc and iron. So if you've had your gallbladder removed, the supplement I recommend the most is something called Lipogest. And what this is, is this actually, it has ox bile and, and other things, but ox bile is one of the main ingredients. And you take this, right before you eat a meal, especially a meal with fat, because it, the bile in the supplement will help support your natural processing of that fat and emulsification of that fat. Because when you eat fat, it has to be emulsified to properly be absorbed. And that's what happens when you've had your gallbladder removed, is you've removed the timing structure of how bile is, is secreted when your food hits. Uh, hit your intestines. So that's what I would recommend. You can use gluten shield as well and it has enzymes in it that help you break down protein, carbs, and fat as well. But for fat absorption, you have to emulsify fat. And so if your history is that you've had your gallbladder removed, you need something to act as an emulsifier um, because you still have a functioning pancreas. You're probably making adequate quantities of pancreatic digestive enzymes. So, so again, bile is probably more of what you would use to support that. How long does it take to detox from amalgam removal in order to see an improvement in tinnitus? Um, it depends on whether or not you're assuming that your tinnitus is caused by your mercury or silver amalgam. That you know, There are many causes of tinnitus. Mercury certainly can be one. Um, but it may not be, it may not be what is causing your tinnitus. Again, that would be something if you're, if, if you're certain that it's causing your tinnitus, it can take months. I mean, three to six or more months to get through um, a good detox protocol like that to, to see some changes. Is inositol um, safe for someone with gluten sensitivity? I would avoid a rice bran uh, form of inositol, um, but, you know, but beyond that, yes. Um, What is vitamin K2 good for? Um, would you recommend it? Yeah, I would, Chantel. Vitamin K2 predominantly is, is critical for um, shuttling calcium where it's supposed to go to keep calcium from basically overpopulating or overdepositing into your blood vessels. It's one of its primary jobs is to help get calcium into your bone. So um, it's very important in, in that regard. And I do recommend it on a regular basis. Generally, in, my, in the people that come to see me in my clinic, we do testing. So we test to make sure they need K and all the other vitamins as well um, to make that type of decision. But yes, I do recommend it. Dairy should be avoided because it causes inflammation. What about goat dairy? So Sarah, um, goat dairy is actually A2 dairy, so it's a better option than cow dairy. But some people are still allergic to it, and that's where... Testing can help you determine that. Um, so um, dairy can definitely be a major cause of inflammation in folks. So that's where I would just encourage you to, to know that, what, you know, if you're trying to use goat dairy, you know, it's first determine whether or not you're, there's, there's, 
You can be intolerant to dairy, you can be sensitive to dairy, or you can be allergic to dairy. And, and rule those three things out before you make the effort at trying to consume dairy. The other thing is if you're new to the gluten-free diet and you're trying to overcome an autoimmune condition, you should avoid dairy for the first six months regardless of whether you're reactive to it because it's got a lot of crossover in its protein structure to gluten. And so some people will, will cross-react to dairy, even, even good, healthy, safe types of dairy. Okay, so yeah, somebody's asking about um, hydrogen peroxide, you know, nebulization. Um, I'm, you know, look, I'm not a huge fan of that. Um, if you're not for a leaky gut, I think there's just far too many better things that can be done for leaky gut than trying to trying to aerosolize hydrogen peroxide and get it into the gut. I think you've got a lot better options than that. Uh, would a sun lamp be helpful in parts of the country where we see little natural sun this time of year? And what do you recommend? Yeah, I think I think a sun lamp is a great idea. I think two, there, there's two things that you can actually do. One is actually a UV producing light, and and there are a number of brands. I don't recommend one particular brand over another, but but there are you know sun lamps which which produce UV light, and that's not the same thing as what we call happy light. Happy light does not make vitamin D, whereas a UV light does. Happy light helps hit your eyes and helps you make melatonin. Melatonin is an important antioxidant, it's an important anti-inflammatory, it's important for immune system function, but it also helps you fall asleep and stay asleep at night. So. Both of these things can be very helpful. Any of you living above 27 degrees latitude could benefit from those. Uh, during these long, drawn-out winters where you get cabin fever and, and the problem just um, really is a lack of, of a ability to get any sunshine. Um, question on hypothyroidism. <laughs> I like that. Chris says, please laugh, Dr. Osborne. <laughs> I had to keep a straight face through the whole thing. That was the challenge. But um, anyway, Lynn's asking, can you be cured from hypothyroidism if you stop eating gluten? Some people can, Lynn, because for some people, the cause of their hypothyroidism is gluten. That's not true of everyone, but it, it's very true of many. And so the answer is yes, but not again. We can't answer that across the board for everyone. Philene's asking, do copper bracelets work? They do. They work for a lot of arthritic pains and aches. Our copper bracelets can work actually quite well. Let's see here. Have you heard anything that uh, the disease that shall not be named causes um, suffering with it? Um, so you got to elaborate for me, Virginia, when you say O A B, um, spell that out. Let's see here. After a couple of days in my crock pot, my beef bones, I make much, I make broth with. Let's see, I can't read that. It's just um, not cohesive. Should I eat those bones from grass-fed cows in Katy, Texas? So, I mean, okay, so the question is, you're making bone broth from bones that you get from grass-fed cows in Katy, Texas. I, I, I don't see why you couldn't, as long as they're healthy cows. You know, Katy, Texas is closer to the city, so you will, in that grass, get more of the of the environmental pollutants that, that's also closer to the city. But, um, you know, unless you actually did testing, you know, forensic testing, metal testing on those bones, I, 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 would, I would feel comfortable eating them. I, I don't think, you know, again, as long as they're being pasture raised, um, I, think, I think you'll be okay. Um, yeah, so I, about the sun lamp and the happy light, yeah, both would be good investments if you, um, if you live north, I mean, because you want that vitamin D on your skin. I know for me in the middle of winter, in, in Texas, I live in Texas, South Texas, so we generally, we have the ability to get out and get that sunshine, even in December, is 80 degrees today. Um, but, but there are time periods from January through February where it gets so cold and so rainy and there's not enough sunshine that, that using a UV light to, to make vitamin D is not a bad idea. And, and it's something I've done you know, over a number of years, we just don't, you don't use that UV light to tan. You're not trying to get a tan, you're trying to make vitamin D and get your skin some of that exposure. Another good thing a lot of people do is they just snowbird in the winter. They go down south 
further south, like down to Mexico or further south to get to get some sun in the mid of winter. So if you're, you know, if you live up in Montana or you live up in like Minnesota where it really gets cold and, you know, you know you're trying to plan your vacation, maybe look at a January where you, you, you snowbird down to the south and, and kind of interrupt that winter, the, the harshness of that winter with some sunshine. Let's see. Jessica says, like your new t-shirt. How can I get one? Yeah, check this out. So this was my Christmas present from my team. Um, my graphics guy put this together uh, with the help of my other team members. And um, you can see here, it's got a picture of me, which I got a great kick out of. This is an awesome shirt. How can you get one? Uh, we have a, we have a, you can't buy them. So the only way you really can get one is when you, when you make an order, when we do our sales, when you make an order over 500 at Gluten Free Society, we throw a t-shirt in for free. So reach out to, to Jessica at Gluten uh, Free Society. That's glutenology at gmail.com and you can ask her about it. Uh, best way to address TMJ pain depends on what's triggering it. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a condition where magnesium deficiency causes grinding of the teeth at night. And many people have that, and that's why magnesium can work so well. So that's one of the reasons TMJ pain can actually develop. So if that's the reason why yours is developed, magnesium might be a great thing to use. Um, other people have, you know, have abnormal bites, overbites, and other problems. And so if you've got a great dentist, have them check you out. I mean, sometimes it's a matter of some dental work. Sometimes it's a matter of some manual manipulation around the temporal mandibular joint. Chiropractors do a great job of, of manual manipulation of that joint. So, I mean, there's a, there's a number of different things that can be done. Let's see, what do I think about, so a lot of questions about what I think about different tests. I generally don't comment about specific brand names of, of others um, simply because I don't like to, I don't like to, you know, the old adage, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Um, so a lot of the technology that's being, that's being popularized and used in kind of the internet world, in my opinion, is, is just to put it very frank, it's piss poor, it's not super academic or scientific, it, it's not reliable, it's not reproducible, you can do blind samples of the same patients and you can get, get back completely different results on a lot of these tests that you can buy direct consumer. So I don't, I don't recommend people waste their money on them. Um, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna dive into brands or names or companies. Uh, let's see here. What does gluten, uh, does gluten cause rheumatoid arthritis? So, so Helena, I wrote an entire book called No Grain, No Pain with the premise of gluten and autoimmune disease, including rheumatological autoimmune disease. You should go read it. Um, because the answer is absolutely yes, gluten can contribute to arthritis. Uh, Laura's asking about mold. Does that include bathroom mold? Yes, it does. So, so you can have mold growing in your home that, that is emitting toxins and, and debris that you're breathing in that can poison you. And you can also have mold that grows inside of you. There, you know, there's different species of yeast. For example, candida uh, is, is a, the most well-known example, but there are other examples of mold. Geotrichum and rhodotorula are also molds that can grow internally inside of people that can make them sick. So, um, you know, mold, can, again, it can be external environmental mold. It can also be internal mold that's growing as a result of a number of reasons, a variety of different reasons. Mold is typically opportunistic. So when it grows in you, it's generally because you're immunosuppressed in some way. Let's scroll down on the left. Is rosacea permanent or can it be healed as your gut heals? I've seen rosacea heal numerous times. So, I mean, I, I fall in the camp of, yes, it can be. I think where most people struggle with it is they just don't look hard enough to find why it's there. Uh, let's see. It may sound silly, but can gluten sensitivity cause hair breakage and hair loss? It can, Cindy. Um, we did an entire show on hair loss not too long ago. I actually presented a case study of severity of hair loss um, and complete regrowth. So it absolutely can. Gluten can cause hair loss for numerous reasons. One of the reasons it can cause autoimmune hair loss, alopecia areata, which is a classic example of autoimmune hair loss. And then it can cause malnutrition, 
leading to you know lack of nutrients that are necessary for hair to properly grow and also to be strong remember hair just like gums are made out of collagen and so nutritional deficit can make your hair um, break easy and can make it fall out easier it can also make it not grow in as well could i use my plant light on myself sure why not um, um yeah you i mean it, it check the kind of light emission that your plant light has and compare it but you know you should most of them are, are pretty much the same these lights a lot of them are the same scroll down the left somebody's asking about is testing for vitamin levels it's 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 not what test i recommend as much as it is what methodology which is it's a it's an, a methodology that is intracellular so it's a it's a functional outcomes intracellular methodology where where we actually measure the growth rate of cells um, based on the nutritional density of what's inside the cells and that so that's a technology that that can be used but not not in, not particularly like one test Let's see, keep going down. Uh, bottom on both sides. Okay. Um, let's see here. Repeat bouts of tonsillitis indicative of gluten sensitivity and autoimmune disease. It can be. I mean, re repeated bouts of tonsillitis. Remember, your tonsils can become inflamed for a lot of different reasons. You can get an upper respiratory infection inflaming your tonsils, but you can also be eating foods that your body perceives to be an enemy, and that can also cause tonsillitis. So the answer to that is um, the gluten can definitely do it. It's not the only reason that it can happen, but it's definitely a strong one. All right. I think we, we got through most. I, I didn't I don't know if I missed any or not. If I did, I apologize. But um, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up at seven o'clock, and I'm hungry. I'm gonna go eat uh, a gluten-free dinner. And uh, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the show tonight. I wanted to bring a little education with a little humor. So if you were offended, this isn't the right place for you. And if uh, and if you enjoyed the night, uh, share this information. Help me get it out. Our goal is to save 100 million lives, and we need to uh, do that through grassroots word of mouth because. The powers that be continue to censor the truth as, as many of you have experienced over these past couple of years. And so in order for us to get the information out, it's gotta be shared far and wide. And if you don't wanna be on the censor list or the naughty list, if you will, make sure you come sign up for my nice list at glutenfreesociety.org. Sign up for our newsletter there where, where we can ensure you'll get our information without being censored. Look, I wish you all a very Merry Christmas that's right. Merry Christmas, not happy holidays. Merry Christmas and a happy new year. And we'll see you in a couple weeks. I'm taking some time off next Monday to spend with my family and I hope you do too. So take care and we'll see you in two weeks for Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Love y'all. Take care. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is gonna allow us to remind you right before we go live, but it's also gonna allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.